Could the offense slow down in a good way this upcoming season? We'll talk about that next year on Locked On. Horn Frogs is your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm your host, Stephen Simcox. Thanks for uh, joining the show. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts in its audio form. It's Friday, uh, April 5th. If you're interested, according to Jeremy Clark from 247 Sports, Horn Frog Blitz website, open practice tonight at Amon G. Carter Stadium starting at 6 o'clock. So if you're listening to this right now, you're in the area, you don't have Friday night plans, maybe you can get out there, check out the Frogs. Open practices and spring games. I think you can glean something from them. I feel like coaches are so paranoid now that typically they're going to be pretty vanilla in these situations, right? You're not going to see – you'll see the personnel that you'll typically see during the season. Last year, I remember, people got really frustrated because during the ESPN Plus broadcast, they didn't broadcast all the game, the spring game. I mean, they would do some of it, but then they would interview somebody or do a special story vignette during the game. Um But we get limited access. This is one of the few opportunities we have to see the team. So good chance to at least see the guys on the roster, who they're running out there with the ones and twos. I'm very curious about the O-line. Who are the five guys that are starting right now? I know that's going to change up to a certain extent when Cade Bennett gets there from San Diego State. Also the potential of Branson Hickman or Marcus Bryant from SMU coming over. I know they're recruiting those guys. Marcus Bryant's a tackle. Branson Hickman played center at SMU for the past few seasons and I would assume would play in the interior. But Colton Deary, Bless Harris, Carson Bruno, Cooper Powers, uh, Ben Taylor Whitfield, those are the names we've been hearing so far. How is, how is that group gelling together? What does an Andy Avalos defense look like just on the field? How are they lining up? How often are they in three-man fronts? How often are they in four- and five-man fronts? How are they using guys like Marcel Brooks coming off the edge of that stud linebacker position? Abe Kamara was somebody we talked about yesterday who could break out this upcoming season, has made some plays through the years, has been an important part of this defense, now sliding into more of a hybrid linebacker slash safety role. So he'll be using coverage, but also be used up in the line of scrimmage. He said he's super excited about being able to pressure the quarterback and getting after the QB. What kind of blitz packages is Coach Avalos instilling right now? How far are they in the install? All these are things that if you're there tonight, you know, check it out. Give me your impressions here in the YouTube comments, or you can tweet at me as Scott Steven. Let me know what your thoughts are getting to see the team on the field for the first time. So that's happening. And spring practice we're at the midpoint, I would say, as they continue to roll through and get ready for the spring game. Of course, Josh Hoover out, Ken Seals and Haas Haney, the guys at QB taking reps. One thing I thought about yesterday, there was so much talk last offseason about the tempo of this offense, that that was going to be a huge part of it. And there were questions coming into it because Kendall Bryles, during his time at Baylor, they went super fast, obviously. That was their calling card. That was what they did. And he replicated that at different stops like Florida State, FAU. But then at Arkansas, when he worked for Sam Pittman, he changed things up a little bit. They didn't use tempo as much. And they used a lot more pre-snap motion, There's a lot of window dressing before the snap, trying to get, especially in the run game, trying to infuse defenses, trick their eyes, make them flow the wrong way. And so I wondered, would he get back to his roots or would he take some of that pace that he had at Arkansas and instill it here at TCU? And it became pretty clear through the offseason. The coaches mentioned it multiple times. I remember A.J. Ricker in a press conference saying that the tempo is the key to this offense to make it move. Sonny Dyke said they're going to go fast. Chandler Morris did an interview with Andy Staples, I believe, and said that Chad Morris, his dad, was at a practice during the offseason, and he was like, how are you going so fast? This is the fastest I've ever seen it. And so we were excited about it, right? Or at least I was excited about it. I was excited about the potential of what they could do in a hurry-up situation. And last season – the offense did some good things. I mean, they, they churned out a lot of yards, 
but they struggled to move the chains at times. They struggled to score in the red zone really all year long. And we all sort of lamented. It felt like there was a lack of identity for the whole team, honestly. Like I, I would say last year's team never really got an identity. I think it got better when Josh Hoover took over, but I, I don't know what their calling card was last year. Two years ago, they were very physical. They were also explosive on offense. That was a key ingredient that was missing. But it seemed like they were trying to build the whole plane out of going at a lightning quick speed last season. And it didn't work. And they traded off a lot of empty possessions and put the defense in bad situations. And so much of that, too, was predicated around the fact that they struggled to consistently run the ball. Now, Monty Bailey ended up with over 1,000 yards. He had a nice season. But there were a lot of tackles for loss. There were a lot of short yard situations where they simply couldn't get push and get first downs. And we haven't heard a lot about what they're going to do this year. Now I would say no news means they're probably going to keep it the same, but I do wonder, you know, Sonny Dykes talked a lot when he made that hire of Kendall Bryles about they shared, they both shared, um, an identity of you have to run the ball well, like that has to be a part of what you want to do. You have to be explosive. And they weren't last year. And maybe that was kind of the key missing part of this, along with inconsistent O-line play that led to some issues. But, I mean, a couple seasons ago, TCU would have some rough stretches at times on offense, maybe a quarter or two. They made up for it, though, by hitting big plays. They would hit big plays, and it would sort of erase some of those mistakes that they made. Um, Last year's team didn't do that. Now, I'm hopeful with a QB that's coming back, even though he's not getting reps right now, in a second year in the system, that he'll get to work with these wide receivers, that you'll have more explosive wideouts, that Eric McAllister can make some plays, that Savion Williams can maybe take the next step and get some opportunities down the field. Possibly Braylon James is someone who is more of a a downfield threat than we realize right now because we just don't know a lot about him coming over from Notre Dame. Didn't get a ton of playing time last season. I'm just skeptical in this day and age. Like, going fast, I understand the benefits of it, but I don't feel like – Last year's team, as an offense, I don't feel like they had defenses on their heels very often. And one thing that that frustrated me a lot, too, and I get the – I get the thought process, but third and short, fourth and short, they're sprinting to the line. Or sometimes, even after the few big plays they would have, they're immediately getting up to the line. And I get what they're trying to do. It's like, okay, you just had a big play get to the line of scrimmage immediately, don't allow the defense to substitute, don't allow the defense to think straight, to get in a a formation. They have to keep things vanilla. They have to basically tell you what they're going to do pre-snap, and then you have your your pick of what to do. But I felt like the offense was going so fast at times that they didn't have a great understanding of what they were doing. And a lot of times they get up to the line after big play, and hand the ball to the running back, and it would just be a little dive play that they would get one or two yards on. Or third and short, fourth and short. I remember the SMU game last season. I think they had a fourth and two, and they sprinted up the line, and Chandler just floated a pass up in the air. And there was even a penalty. There was either a penalty or somebody jumped up and snagged the ball. But bottom line was they didn't really execute anything. They just sort of got fortunate on a great catch or a penalty. I forget exactly what happened. But there were a lot of those instances last season where it felt like they were trying to catch the defense off guard, but they were going so fast that they didn't even have organization themselves, and the plays just ended up falling flat. So I think there's a time and a place for moving at a good pace, but I do wonder if you can dial it back a little bit and maybe execute plays better, how beneficial that is for the offense. I don't know that's going to be the case, though, because I said – That was a huge part of what they did last season. They haven't indicated that there's going to be any sort of change in that regard. And usually somebody's pretty open about those types of changes 
at least publicly, he'll say, hey, yeah, we're working on this or that. And we haven't heard that so far this season. When we come back, I mentioned briefly yesterday that Jamie Dixon was reportedly in the mix for the USC job, but I didn't spend a lot of time on it because I thought it wasn't going to happen. And I guess there was enough smoke behind it that TCU administration felt like they needed to find a way to lock him up. I'll talk about what that means here coming up on Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day. I want to mention one of our new sponsors, Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on 3% match. Robinhood Gold will get you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscriptions fees do apply. Now for some legal info, legal info, excuse me. Claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Robin Hood, proud sponsor here of the Locked On Network. Eric Musselman is the new coach at USC. Strange move. Eric Musselman going from Arkansas to USC. He did have a rough year at Arkansas this past season, but in my mind, feels like uh, Arkansas is a better job. I did have Kyle Cruz, uh, old TCU classmate of mine and, and friend of mine, uh, mentioned, hey, have you been to Fayetteville lately? L.A. is definitely an upgrade, and I get that. I understand that aspect of it. But at the same time, I was just thinking about the jobs themselves. I thought it was, at the very least, a lateral move going from place to place, but maybe it was just time for uh, for him to move on. Um, I mentioned that though yesterday because Jamie Dixon's name had come up in some discussions. Jeff Goodman from the Field of 68 on a podcast. They were talking about the USC job opening and Jamie Dixon was one of the names that he mentioned. Um, John Rossing also said that he was he was in the mix there. I really didn't give a lot of credence to it because I simply didn't think it was going to happen, but it was out there in the world. Usually Every offseason or every other offseason, Coach Dixon's name comes up in one of these job openings. And honestly, I think it's mainly just because he's pretty well respected around the industry. He did a good job at Pitt. He's done a nice job at TCU. He's got a reputation for being someone who can rebuild a program, rebuild a roster. And so those guys are going to be popular names when the time comes for finding someone new. Um, I didn't really think there was – much to it though at all. And so that's why I just briefly mentioned it the other day. Well, yesterday I'm poking around on social media and I see Steven Johnson says after leading TCU to a third straight NCAA tournament, Jamie Dixon and TCU have agreed to a contract extension. His deal will be extended out through the 2029, 2030 season. So they're adding two more years to his deal. He will be the coach here at TCU through 2030. At least that's what his contract says. I'm pretty confused by this. Now, I am not someone that thinks TCU needs to move on from Jamie Dixon at this point. I know a lot of you are. You're frustrated with the constant, I mean constant, it's been three seasons, the multiple exits in the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. To a certain extent, feels like the team has reached its ceiling. They're going to be good. They're going to be competitive. They're going to be a 500 team in the Big 12. And then probably between a seven and a 10 seed. Good chance to win a first round game. It'll be tough to win a second round game based on the matchup. This year they got beat pretty soundly by Utah State. My questions are this. One, who are we bidding against? Because other than that USC report, I didn't really see anything out there. I saw his name floated around a little bit in the Louisville opening. But again, it just felt like it didn't feel like there was actual sources there. It just felt like, hey, there's a pretty good job opening here. Who are some names that would make sense? Oh, Jamie Dixon, he's turned around a few programs. Maybe that's a good fit. That was my read on his name coming up in these job searches. I don't think it was imminent that he was leaving like he was going to leave to UCLA a few years back, and then the buyout didn't work out, and we all know how that story went. 
USC also would have made sense because he has family there. And so he would have been getting back to his, to his home. Right. Um, so that was my first interesting thought about this is who, who are you bidding against? What, like what was going on behind the scenes that made you feel like, Hey, we need to make sure that we're making a public commitment to this coach because contract extensions, that's all they are. It's just, it's basically the school saying, Hey, back off. And it doesn't mean other schools have to respect that, but it's sort of a shot across the bow of, Hey, this is our guy. If you're going to come take him, you're going to have to pay a hefty fee. That's all contract extensions are. My other question, the timing of this is strange to me. Yes. Great accomplishment. Making the NCAA tournament three straight years, never been done in program history. He has elevated the program to a much higher level than when he took over. They are, I mean, it's consistently expected now that TCU should be in the field of 68. For a long time, that was not the case. Totally get that. But this team did not, this team last year did not close the season well. I mean, their last big win was against Baylor and Waco in late January. And after that, it was very up and down. And honestly, I know I'm supposed to be a good company, man. The Big 12 was kind of overrated this year. I still think overall it's the best basketball conference in America, but there was not a Kansas team that went and won the national title this year. There was not a Baylor team. You know, Baylor won the national title a few years back. KU won it the year after. There was not a top dog like that. Houston was great. I think Houston was a really good basketball team. I feel like if uh, Jamal Shedd would have stayed healthy in that Duke game, they're probably in the Final Four. I picked them to win it all before the tournament. But bottom line was they got bounced in the Sweet 16. I feel for him. It stinks that he went down with an injury, and I think they would have won that game if he was healthy. At the end of the day, though, they couldn't make it past the Sweet 16. Iowa State, same story. Everybody else got bounced pretty much in the first weekend. Baylor got beat by Clemson, and that was a Clemson team that beat TCU soundly early in the season. Um, and Texas had a disappointing year, got bounced early in the tournament. They sort of came on towards the end of the year. But my point being, this was a year where I think you could have won 10, 11, 12, Big 12 games without having a great team. Kansas was down, right? They weren't nearly as good as they typically are. TCU should have won that game at Allen Fieldhouse, but we know what happened. So the timing is just odd to me because – it felt like you were in the downswing of a good three-year run with Mike Miles and Damian Ball. You lose all those guys. Okay, you give Coach credit for piecing the roster together and getting them back to the tournament, but they didn't close the season really strong. And I think, honestly, a big reason why they made the tournament this year was because of the Big 12's reputation, which is, I mean, that's a benefit of being in this league. But the way they closed the season – you know, they beat a, a shorthanded Oklahoma team. They blew a huge lead against BYU on the road. They beat a very bad West Virginia team on the road, first time to win in Morgantown ever. And then they lose to UCF at home. They beat Oklahoma. They get beat badly by Houston in the Big 12 tournament. Finish 9-9 nine and nine in conference play. If there was ever a year to win 10 or 11 conference games, it felt like this should have been the year. So the timing is just strange to me. I don't I don't know why there's pressure to extend his contract. Now, I don't think – it's easy for me to say this because I'm not the person that Jeremiah Donati calls if a buyout situation is on the table. But I don't think this means TCU is hamstrung and can't move on if things take a drastic turn over the next few years. Because everybody says they can't afford buyouts, but then buyouts get afforded, right? I had a couple local. I worked with a couple of Oklahoma State people, and I was asking them during the season about Mike Boyd, and the thing they kept telling me was, "Well, we can't afford his buyout." Well, the season ended, and suddenly all the money for the buyout showed up, right? Um, Jimbo Fisher, uh, A and M's in a horrible situation, can't afford the buyout. They afforded the buyout. People figure this stuff out if it has to be figured out. Okay, so I don't think this means they're committed to Coach Dixon for life. It's just a strange move to me. The timing of it's strange. Again, I think Jamie's done a great job turning the program around. I feel like he needs to be the guy to lead the team right now. I think 
he's earned the opportunity to put another team together, another core roster together with these young players he has coming in and see what he can do. But the contract extension is pretty baffling to me. I'm not sure what the ignition was for that, what the catalyst was to get that done in a time where I don't really think there was a ton of interest outside. Of course, I'm not behind the scenes. I don't know for sure. And I felt like you're coming off your worst year in a little while, right? Of the three seasons they made the tournament, this past year's team was the least talented in that group. They still made it, though. I mean, still made the NCAA tournament. It's a big accomplishment for TCU. But I get why people are starting to question, hey, at what point do expectations shift and change? Because the uh, the downside of turning the program around is eventually people want more. People are never content with just the status quo. So at, at what point in his tenure can we start saying, hey, all right, it's time to take the next step? And he'll now have a new core group of players to go do that and apparently a new contract moving forward as well. When we come back, we'll wrap things up with some audience reaction. And uh, TCU Baseball, another big series. They try to climb back into the Big 12 race that's coming up next year on Locked on Horned Frogs, your team every day. Game time is the best place to get secondary tickets. A few weeks ago, um, I got TCU baseball tickets on the game time app. They're on the burn, but I was able to move in to the seats eventually. And it was great. No hassle, very little stress. It's true. There's no hidden fees. They tell you exactly what you're going to pay. I mean, there are some fees there, but they tell you exactly what you're going to pay when you see the tickets. Locked on college is the promo code for $20 off. Go to the game time app, download it today. Locked on college for $20 off. It's the best place for last minute tickets. If you if you're coming up to an event and it's day of, day before, and you're like, there's no way I'm gonna get tickets, I bet you can if you download the game time app because they have flash deals, they have great savings up to an hour into the event. It's not just sporting events, concerts, theater shows, comedy shows, whatever you need, the game time app has it for you. Again, that promo code locked on college for $20 off. You can save up to 60%. If you buy at the last minute for sports, comedy, theater, et cetera, they have flash deals, zone deals, all in pricing. They show you exactly what you're going to pay for your tickets. Um, you get a view of your seat when you see the tickets online. It's right there. Okay, this is what I'm going to see when I sit down. Game time, best app around for secondary tickets or tickets on the secondary market. Try it today. Download the game time app. Locked on college, the promo code, get $20 off your first purchase. TCU baseball, we got a series against Cincinnati this weekend. Uh, it's cold up in Ohio, so games are starting earlier. Game will be at 4 o'clock Central time. Today, on Saturday, they play at uh, noon, and on Sunday, they play at 11 o'clock. All games can be seen on ESPN+. Plus. So, big opportunity here for the Frogs. Um, the good news for TCU is, Pretty much everybody in the conference has been up and down. Now, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are playing well. They're seven and two and six and three, respectively. But Texas lost to BYU last night. I mean, it's been uh, it's been kind of like Big Twelve basketball to a certain extent. Now, I don't think the teams in Big Twelve baseball are that good. I feel like it's a lot of middle of the road teams, honestly. But everybody's kind of jumbled up in the same spot. So. A good opportunity, though, if they can get a sweep or win two out of three to get themselves back in the mix before hitting that stretch of games against Texas Tech. And Texas, Luis Rodriguez was Big 12 Pitcher of the Week last week. I'm guessing he's going to go on Friday and then Peyton Tole Saturday, Cole Klecker Sunday. You really need Cole to step up and get in a better rhythm. That's been, you know, um, one of the things that's really missing from this season. Bullpen has still been kind of shaky, but they've gotten much better innings from their starters lately, so that's a huge plus. TCU, Cincinnati, Frogs trying to uh, continue to get over 500 in Big 12 play, sitting at 5-7 and seven after that sweep at Houston this past weekend, trying to win another series in uh, conference play against Cincinnati for the first time as a Big 12 member. A couple of um, audience reactions, some thoughts from you guys before we go. Uh, Jacob Langford on the basketball note says he has an inside source from Toledo. Dante Maddox is very good. Not sure if we get him, but here's hoping for hoops. Yeah, they need somebody at that guard spot. And Maddox is a good player. Shoots 40% from three, can handle the ball well. 
scored a lot of points this past season. I know he's got significant interest from teams around the country, but you're right. If TCU can land him, that would be a great spot. And then CFB fan wanted to know if I think there are current TCU players who will hit the transfer portal in this upcoming portal window. Yes, I think there will be some guys that move on. I hate to speculate because I just don't really know what the thought process is for a lot of these players, but I'll just go by position. I feel like we probably have one running back that leaves just because there's not going to be enough carries to go around. Um, I really hope they can keep Trent Battle, Cam Cook, and Trey Sanders together, though. Uh, Corey Rand already hit the portal. I'm, I'm hopeful that this room can stay together. you got some young freshmen as well. I don't expect those young guys to be moving on. But I wouldn't be surprised if maybe one of those veteran running backs looks for an opportunity somewhere else. Hopefully they can keep those guys together, though. Um, I think you'll have a couple wide receivers also that leave just because that's always a popular position for guys to move on. And then I assume you'll see some guys move on on defense. I'm just not sure who yet, but I think there will be a few players that maybe sense they're out of position in the new defense and want to give it a try somewhere else. We'll be back on Monday. Uh, thanks for joining us this week. It's Locked on Horn Frogs, and it's your team every day.